Hello everyone and welcome to the X1 Metal 3D Printing webinar brought to you by Shapeways. Today we have Brandon Carey and Steve Wart. Brandon is from X1 and Steve is from Shapeways and I am Rhonda Gee, the Director of Marketing Communications for Shapeways. I will be moderating today and taking your questions. So please, if you have any questions along the way, enter them into the chat. With that, I'm going to turn it on over to Brandon to give a full introduction of himself and then to Steve. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's presentation. Um, hopefully everybody can see what I'm presenting here. My name is Brandon Carey. I am the technical sales uh, manager here at X1. Uh, my primary focus is to support our service bureau. Um, I'll give a little more information on what that means to X1. Uh, but we are primarily a binder jetting company. And uh, yeah, going to go ahead and uh, start here. Okay, uh, I'm Steve Wirt, Director of Customer Success here at Shapeways. Um, been an additive for like around nine years, but I'll tell you, one of the things that I've been super excited to see is just kind of the maturity of metal 3D printing and where it's come from. So I'm uh, just happy to be here with one of our premier partners, X1, to learn everything that they're doing in, in the metal space. Great. Thanks, Steve. All right. So we'll start. So today's agenda is going to be basically <clears throat> to kind of walk you through what binder jetting is. Um, binder jetting has been around for, uh, well, one's been around for 26 plus years. So I'm um, excited to share a little bit about what we can do. Um, also share what materials we offer through Shapeways and what's also upcoming and exciting. Um, a little bit of overview of our current applications and our ever growing applications. And I also wanna dive into a little bit of design considerations and that is typically pretty important to the Shapeways community. So I like to be able to share uh, why we do things the way we do, um, what type of considerations we run through when we're reviewing parts prior to the production status. And then we'll end up with a uh, Q and A. Okay, so overview of X1. Uh, like I said, X1's been around since 1995. We actually used to be a division of Extrude Hone, which still exists today. Uh, they are a honing process and we were just a small portion of that company. Um, over time, that business took off. We actually started off 3D printing gold, if you can imagine that. Um, and as the price of gold increased, uh, it didn't become as, you know, the business case wasn't there anymore. So we, we transitioned on into actually uh, soda lime glass. And then eventually uh, around the same time that we started working with Shapeways, we transitioned to stainless steel. Um, we are a, you know, we are a machine manufacturing company. That's, you know, our biggest business case. We do both uh, stainless steel machines or steel machines as well as sand. Um, sand is still a big portion of our business today, um, but the direct metal business is, you know, aggressively growing as, you know, added manufacturing metal grows in, you know, in the world. So um, we do manufacture, you know, high volume parts. So we do a lot of focus in oil and gas. There's a lot of focus on uh, automotive. If you can imagine where most of our facilities are located in Troy, Michigan. So um, we do touch a lot in the industrial markets, like I just said, uh, automotive, aerospace, defense. Uh, we are transitioning heavily in the medical as well today. Um, always have been very, very successful in architecture aspect of the business, as well as, you know, consumer base and jewelry based product line. And the, the business is always growing. Um, every single year, we see roughly 10% growth. So that's, uh, you know, a positive inclination every year for X1. All right, so a little bit about the machines that are run primarily for the Shapeways offering. We do both an MFlex and the 25 Pro. Uh, if you look here, they are the same exact build envelope. Um, the biggest difference really has just been transition and over time of the engineering aspect of the equipment. So as additive grows, you know, speed becomes ever increasingly more important. So we have transitioned from the M-Flex to the 25 Pro. 
The Mflex typically runs a coarser powder, uh, which is the infiltrated material, which you know we are pretty infamous for as it stands today. And as we grow, we are moving you know, into the single alloy business, such as 316L, which we'll talk about a little bit here today as well. So real quick on this one, do the Mflex and X125 Pro pretty much do the same thing? It's just a newer machine, or does the Mflex still have certain things uh, or do different things that the X125 Pro can't? Yeah, great question. Um, so it does actually, the 25 Pro does have the capability to, to print powders that the Mflex was not able to print when we manufactured it years ago. Um, so what we have done is we upgraded the machine to have what we call an ACT system. And it's basically just an advanced compaction system um, that allows you to print fine powders. So like the Mflex has the capability to print down this to 15 micron, but the 25 Pro has the capability to print down to five micron powders. And as okay. your powder size increases, it's a little bit more difficult to flow. Um, a lot of other 3D printing businesses will do additives to their uh, powder to allow it to flow better. We decided as a business to not go that direction. We want to be able to pull materials right off the shelves and print them just to make the consumable product line for you know customers a little bit easier. All right. Ways uses both of these offerings, and we do. Do you want to expand on that a little? Absolutely. Um, so as it stands today, we are primarily using the Mflex for the Shapeways product line. Um, we will get into that a little bit later. Uh, what's up and coming, we do run kind of a beta level right now on the 25 Pro for 316L, but there is you know, some exciting upcoming news that we will transition to a larger launch. You have another question. Will steel rust over time if exposed to water? So it depends on the product offering. If we're looking at the 420 uh, stainless steel and bronze, uh, it, it, it will, it is prone to oxidation over time, um, depending on its environment. So if it's in a salt water bath, it will absolutely, you know, rust over time. Um, I do have product that's been in my office since I've been here, you know, for eight plus years that I touch every single day that doesn't have any oxidation on it. So it's, it's really environmentally based. Um, what actually helps to add an extra layer of coating, we do have these you know, finishes and a finish is a patina and a patina, it's rust, right? So um, it does add an extra layer of protection. Okay, and one more question before we move on. How do you decide which printer each model goes to if one print is in finer detail? Oh, great question. Um, so the the detail on the component is kind of really driven by the powder size itself. So, <clears throat> and layer thickness. So layer thickness typically on the Mflex is 100 micron. When we look at the 316L product offerings, the layer thickness jumps down to 50 micron and the powder is finer. So that finer layer, the finer the powder, the finer the end resolution can be. and we will ask throughout the presentation. I'll let you move on to the next slide. Okay. All right, so this is uh, you know, kind of a, an overview of what binder jetting does. Um, the biggest question we always get is where the laser? There is no laser. So we are, we are using binder jetting you know, technology, so obviously we're using a binder. So um, if you look on, on the left side here, that's basically with the ultrasonic dispenser and spreader and compactor. That is our recoding system. So that will you know, go across the whole entire print bed and lay down a layer of powder, depending on what powder size it is or material it is. That's what drives the layer thickness, <clears throat> excuse me. And after that retracts back across the print bed, then the print head comes out. It's just like a print head you have on your HP printer at home. Um, it's basically, instead of laying out ink, it's laying down layer of binder and it's jetting out uh, you know, just a binder and it, it is kind of a bonding agent between layer to layer. And as that part builds, your plate, your build plate will lower down, you know, 
100 microns at a time or whatever whatever decision you make on the material line and as that as that lowers your parts basically nested inside that box and it's surrounded completely by powder so if you look down inside the box it looks as though your box is empty but your part is you know physically in there in a you know a really weak green state essentially it's kind of like building a sandcastle inside of a box okay yeah, late to mjf um i i think that it's you know obviously a little bit different so we're doing kind of the just the stainless steel aspect and the binding aspect where you know i i don't i'm not super super familiar with the other process to be honest so um i'll probably have to get back to you and loop you back on on that to answer that question yeah so brandon essentially what's going on here if i'm looking at this right almost similar to like an ultimaker maker bot like fdm at home printer this is like laying out like glue and then it's going back and kind of reinforcing that over and over at a very very small micron level that's kind of what's going on in this um, binder jetting technology yeah absolutely so it's you know just like you said the the print head basically is printing out an adhesive and it's kind of as tacky as hairspray essentially and <clears throat> so that's saturating downward into the build box and attaching itself to the layer below it that just had powder laid down so <clears throat> after the powder is laid down the print head comes back out and jets down that binder again and it basically bleeds back down to the other layer below it and that is essentially what's bonding everything together in the print aspect there's also you know a there's some ancillary steps after after printing for binder jetting i see and that's why powder size actually becomes so important here uh, when getting into the level of detail okay that makes complete sense yeah absolutely so you know the the powder drives your end density it does it drives your material properties it drives you know your layer thickness resolution everything it's it's a really key indicator for you know linear down the process okay yeah no more questions on that one yeah so this this slide dives a little bit deeper on what happens after the printing aspect <clears throat> So basically step one, obviously you're, you're preparing your file. <clears throat> and this is where you would look at a traditional component that the say has 24 pieces that you can now turn into one unit. And that consolidation is one of the key things that you wanna look for in additive manufacturing in any process, you know, and, and binder jetting, we, we push that a lot. We do what we call an adoption process we push adoption a lot. And what we really try to do through that adoption process is have a really good understanding when you go through DFAM and all these process parameters and what you can do as far as part consolidation. Uh, so then step two is print, which we just talked about in the last slide, as well as build. So what we didn't talk about, what happens after print. So if you were to just basically scoop your hand through that box after print. It's just basically slurry or you know slush. It's just going to fall apart. It is not really strong enough to be able to handle, you know, that type of aggressive motion of the component. So what we do is we take it to cure, and that curing is basically catalyzing that binder and stainless steel together to give you what we call a green body part, and it's basically. If you're familiar with pottery, it's as strong as I would say a bisque fire part. So if you drop it, it would break, um, but it still gives you the capability to pick the part up, move it around and blow and you know evacuate the powder. So that's actually step five is where you are picking up this green body part, removing loose powder from around the part, and you're using both vacuuming air at the same time, uh, you know, in order to get down to that, you know, 3D printed, 60% skeletal structure. Um, post that the powdering process, like I said, you're still at 50%. So obviously you want to get to your, your final, you know, final actual metal structure that's strong enough to be, you know, what everyone wants to call metal today. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take it through a thermal operation. Now, 
we are talking about two different materials here. We're talking about the infiltrated and we're talking about single alloys. So that centering operation is a little variable difference based on temperature and the density you're trying to hit. And if you're deciding to do just a single alloy material and you're highly centering, or you're trying to infiltrate with bronze, which um, which allows you to have you know a little bit less shrinkage during this, the thermal process. So there's two variable centering processes and a little bit different on the back end. So the printing aspect's the same, the curing aspect's the same, but when we transition in the center, there's kind of two offerings. Brandon, can you elaborate on the difference between the print process and the build process? Yeah, so basically when we look at the print process, we look at it as a, you know, essentially 2D, right? So you're looking at a single layer as the print process. The build process is when you begin to start stacking up those layer upon layer upon layer. And also inside of that build process, you are, we have the capability to change parameters during printing. You also have the capability to start begin nesting parts inside of other parts and nesting parts to make an optimal build. So it's basically a transition between 2D to 3D. Great, and does it need support structures or does the bed support the part completely? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so where we differentiate from laser is we do not require those support generation, support structures during the printing process because we're not going to that high temp at print. Um, that powder is actually acting as your support base during the printing process. Now, when you do go to our, you know, our centering process, depending on the size of the component and the mass of the component, sometimes you do need some formation of support, right? So that can either be uh, what we use is alumina grit, and that's basically alumina does the same thing the powder does in the print box and that's supporting that part during that infiltration process when you are looking at centering and you have a lot more motion during that high centering process process you're basically going to require some printed tooling and what we'll do is we'll create tooling in the same exact material that we are using the component out of and have essentially a release agent to separate the two great is the powder reusable yeah, so if typically we only really use about seven for seven to ten percent of the overall envelope is the actual physical part itself. So all of the re all that remaining powder actually is recycled back through our system. We can have powder that's in this building that's been here, you know, for twenty years. Um, we are obviously obviously always sieving and reintroducing, you know, virgin powder back into the into the system to keep everything equalized. Um, but yeah, we absolutely recycle powder and we even recycle binders through our process as well. We have a lot of questions about the sh shrinkage rate between the file dimensions and the finished parts. Could you expand on that a little? Absolutely. That's, uh, let's start with the 420 um, material. And so that infiltration process, typically you'll see shrinkage between 1% to 3%. So what's happening during that infiltration process is you're, if you can imagine holding bowling balls in your arm at a larger scale, what's happening is that the connection points between those bowling balls are what are centering. And just those connection points only, all the empty space is basically being filled with the bronze as the bronze liquefies and wicks into the part like a sponge does to water. Um, so during that process, you do see some, you know, thermal shrinkage. And like I said, that's typically one to 3%. Um, it's more of a percentage base. So as a part gets larger, obviously that, you know, percentage grows. Typically, you know, on an industrial part, we are capable of holding, you know, roughly plus or minus 1%. And it's all dependent on, you know, kind of an iteration factor. You know, binder jetting is an iterative process, so sometimes you will have to look at the data, rescale, and go back to the reprint process if you want to target, you know, a better tolerance range. 
Great. I think that's a great answer and really helpful to understand. With the the shrinkage of one to three percent, would you need to compensate for that in the design? It, it, absolutely. Um, through you know through our Shapeways business structure, we we don't do that scaling up front here at X X one, um, and so you will have to kind of accommodate for that shrinkage. And what I would do <clears throat> is I would just plan on one percent per inch being what I would expect. And lastly, is it symmetrical when it shrinks? Um, so it there is a little bit of variation in Z because of action, right? So gravity does have an effect on the centering process. So let's just say X is shrinking, X and Y shrink 1%, the Z may shrink 1.2%. You know, so there is a slight, slight variable and when you start moving into finer powders, it, you start to see that a little bit more. So what's nice about this 420 material and this infiltration process, it kind of masks that, you know, differentials in your X, Y, and Z, because you're not going to such high temp. You're basically, you know, brazing material together, you know, at a lower firmness temperature. So that material is a little bit more achievable as far as hitting tolerance ranges and, you know, after a low pass. Okay. So we have a poll question. If you look to your right and uh, next to the chat, you'll see a poll tab if you could answer the questions. And we'll give everyone a couple of seconds to answer it before moving on. Well, I feel like Brandon with this one, speed's gotta be a big part of this, right? I mean, versus traditional manufacturing. Cause I always think of, when I think of traditional manufacturing, especially with metals, I'm thinking like Game of Thrones when they're putting the metal into like create the sword. Is that kind of like what that old school way of making metal stuff was and is that really kind of why binder jetting is so much better from a speed perspective. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about the aspect of hogging out a component out of solid block, and if you think about, if you look on Shapeways Marketplace, some of these organic shapes and these crazy geometries that have low, low volume on them, could you imagine trying to machine these parts with a traditional machining or a six axis machine or what that cost would be at the end of the day? So. <clears throat> All that, all that extra material that you're hogging out of this block is, you know, essentially waste at that point. Um, where with, you know, binder jetting, it works in the exact opposite direction. The lower material that you use, it's a cost savings to the end customer. Um, so, you know, waste reduction really is, you know, a big aspect of our our process. Everyone who is going to answer has answered. Um, right now, it looks like all of above is leading, followed by speed. Would you like to elaborate on that with the next slide? Yeah, yeah. No one is wrong. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Basically, you know, s speed is always a contributing factor to added manufacturing, and, and X one really pushes that at the end of the day. And I showed that earlier and kind of the output information moving from the MFLEX to the 25 Pro. So it's, you know, we went from 10 years ago running 90 second layers to today where we're running 20, 30 second layers. And those layers are also cut in half, you know, as far as resolution size. So it's, it's always a big push for CC output as we transition into a you know, an industrial world where, you know, 3D printing is going to be in everyone's house or everyone's business at the end of the day. So that's, you know, we, we need to be there. And I, th I think we're all looking to be there at the end of the day. Um, waste reduction, absolutely. Like I just talked to Steve about, <clears throat> uh, you're not, you know, you're not milling these components anymore. You're not using a lot of, you know, stock material. We actually partner up with CNC operations really, really well. 
you know, we talked a little bit about tolerance. We talked a little bit about the shrinkage and distortion. So we are in that near shape process at the end of the day. Um, you still, you know, depending on what your tolerance expectations are, potentially we'll need to post machine. So what we're doing is we're essentially delivering an 80% complete part. And, you know, the CNC shops are final machining the remainder 20%. And we're saving them time on the machine hogging out of a solid block. And then, you know, that's that's kind of where, you know, atom manufacturing and specifically bonder jetting is really starting to transition into. Um, <clears throat> savings, absolutely. You're like I said earlier, you're the less volume of material you're using. Basically, it, material is the biggest driving factor in our process. So obviously, you're, the volume reduction goes down, your cost goes down. Um, design freedom is a very big one as well. Like I said earlier, you are going from a 24 piece, you know, let's just say 24 piece mold where you're making, let's just say an impeller and you're, you're casting the upper shroud and lower shroud and you're brazing in all the blades. That's a time consuming process where bonder jetting can do that in a single shot, all one process. Um, and you're also getting into the point, you know, the aspect where you can eliminate draft angles uh, for casting. You don't have to worry about any of those types of aspects anymore. Um, <clears throat> there are still limitations of bonder jetting, don't get me wrong, <clears throat> at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, the, the design aspects are starting to get people to think uh, a little bit outside the box and what we call blue sky thinking. And then the, the, the flexibility of bonder jetting as well as what's big for us, we, it's all about what powder do you need? Let us see if we can spread it. Let us see if we can center it. And, you know, our, you know, that at that portion, we're just trying to prove out that we can handle all these different complex materials inside of our, you know, machine parameters. Okay. We have a few questions on what's the approximate ratio between the stainless steel and the bronze filler? Uh, the ratio is basically a high level, 60% stainless, 40% bronze. Now, <clears throat> that's, you know, probably more 55, 40, because, you know, you're, you still have some open density inside your component. And can you comment on the strength comparison between CNC stainless and binder jet, jetting st stainless? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> we get this question a lot, kind of where we, where we stand as far as, you know, between rot, standard block, casting. Um, <clears throat> we line up really, really well with, you know, the casting process on this 420 material. And then when you start transitioning into this 316 material with single alloy, we start bumping up to the strengths, you know, right below rot which, is, you know, is really, really high on the level of, you know, metal strengths. Are the parts that are produced uh, able to be load bearing? Absolutely. Um, so that you basically have to feed in your material when you're looking at, let's say you're manufacturing this part through, you know, SolidWorks, you're able to input your information about your material characteristics and data. We have all the material characteristics out there and the properties are out there. Um, it depends on your load. It depends on the force, but um, we do use our material primarily. One of our biggest components is a material that uses heavy, heavy force. Um, can't talk a lot about that uh, here, but it is a a high, high wear part that we use, that is used, you know, thousands and thousands of times. Great, I'm gonna let you move on. Please keep the questions coming. If we do not get to your questions, we will follow up after the webinar. All right, so this gives a little bit of information of what our output capabilities are after print. So <clears throat> if you look at the top left portion here, it talks about bonded. Bonded really is more in line with our sand printing process where we're printing a casting, or not printing a casting, we're printing a mold that basically allows you to go to casting. So right out of our sand parts, right out of print, are actually, there's no post process that goes directly to the foundry and you're capable to pour directly inside of that material. Um, 
this porous portion would be if we were to print the 420 and throw it to the furnace without introducing the bronze. So what that does is it gives you a part roughly 70 to 80 percent dense, and that is has a high utilization in the filtration, you know, industry. Um, and then the infiltrated product, basically, we talked a little bit about that. That's where you're introducing a material that has a lower melting point. Primarily, we're using bronze. Uh, we also have done copper as well. And then the highly centered is where you're using a, a single material instead of two materials, and you're going to a real high furnace temp, and you're basically centering all the way to you know 98% dense. Okay. Brandon, most of this makes sense, but like porous, you mentioned what was the industry that usually uses the porous that doesn't actually have the bronze infiltration in it? So it's it's used a lot in filtration. So if you can imagine, uh, let's just say sound dampening aspects. Oh, um, okay. Also, if you want to, you know, if you're mining and you're trying to keep separation between different types of you know, materials, it basically acts as a filtration material depending on, you know, how it's built. Okay, that makes complete sense. I see. Okay. Uh, so this lines up a little bit, you know, with the, the previous question, kind of where is our, our material land? So here's metal castings, both low pressure and gravity, kind of we land within, within this range here of the metal and do a little bit of layover with metal injection molding. And then we're, we're higher than press and center typically, but like we just talked about, Steve, you're also able to get in that lower density range without introducing, you know, without introducing bronze, or if you just have, go to a lower temperature. All right. Get it to go. There we go. We'll give everyone a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to answer them. I know car restoration is definitely one of the things that I think is one of the coolest aspects out there, you know, um, especially with all the old classic cars and everybody going towards the electric you know how are we going to be able to make those parts for some of the older older stuff that's out there so i always find that fascinating yeah you see you see all these car restoration shows you know on on tv now and you wonder you always hear them talk about they can't find this piece anymore they can't get this piece anymore so um that is you know a big part of what we do i have a i have a customer that's local um that we do a lot of product line for um and it's everything it's everything from you know 300 sls all the way up to you know cars you've never even heard of so it's uh it's pretty interesting <clears throat> story beat out car restoration so do you want to tell us a little about the applications for steel yeah absolutely um <clears throat> jewelry great answer uh we've always had a lot of success in that business um and you know shapeways has been the biggest driver for helping us get there and you know 14 years later we we still we still see this you know business today um and so you know you you see anything from earrings to necklaces to rings rings are big um and then you know you know underneath jewelry you you're going to start seeing things along the lines of branding irons burners uh what we just talked about car restoration aspects um and then we start getting a little bit into you know tooling underneath that tooling is obviously very very big if you you know think outside the box of what we're capable of manufacturing with binder jetting you can have a very quick prototype tool you know that's cost effective you can have within 10 days or you know so um that and you don't have to wait for you know quote back you don't have to create a 2d drawing you don't have to wait 14 months to get you know you're tolling back and then oh no i gotta make a rev change and i gotta wait another 14 months so 
um, that's kind of where the, you know, the business has been over the last few years. Um, honestly, whenever I'm asked, you know, by my marketing team, what is, what's your biggest application? I'm like, why don't we just ask Shapeways? They know, you know, they, they, that business base has brought us so many products that we couldn't even imagine are possible. It's things that you don't think about. It's this consumer product that someone, you know, creates a design for, and then they create a storefront for that has become successful. And it's something, it change, it's something new every single day. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's great to see, you know, the imaginations out there and you know, the business opportunities out there that, you know, come through the door every single day. So keep it up. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so we're talking a little bit about the 420 material. You know, so you see that one to three percent shrinkage. That is, you know, our most affordable material as it stands today. It is a highly durable part. Has really great wear characteristics in it. Um, the applications for that are also kind of endless. It, it is a different material than what an engineer would give you today. But if you line up the material properties side by side with some other component materials you're looking for, this material will still potentially work inside that application. And it's going to be unbelievably affordable for metal. There's no other metal you're going to find this inexpensive, you know, today. And then you transition to the 316, you know, material that we're, we're looking to transition to a larger base here with Shapeways Tune. Um, it is a little bit more of a difficult process to work through. It does have a higher shrink process. It is 15 to 20% shrinkage because you're going to a higher density. So the application for this material is a true 316 material and not a matrix material like the 420. Um, and this is gonna be your best situation for you know that corrosion resistance we spoke a little bit about earlier. Um, the application is gonna be you know better for potential jewelry, you know, product line because it's a 316 material. Um, and you won't have to worry about any of the effects of oxidation. What it also is gonna drive is a high resolution as well for you. Uh, because you are using a finer powder, you are using a thinner layer, and it is going to pre-liquid phase essentially. So you're also getting a superior surface finish at the end of the day as well. Brandon, there's a question if stainless steel is food grade. Um, so there are stainless steels that are food grade. It, it, don't, it all depends on the post process um, through the FDA compliance. We do not offer any food grade safe materials. We haven't gone down that line. It is a very white paper inclusive, long, long time to go through that type of process. And we haven't had the, you know, the business case to kind of go down that line yet. Will it come? Absolutely. Uh, we just haven't transitioned into that quite yet. Thank you for answering that. Okay. So I just, you know, kind of wanted to show a little bit about some of the products we've done for 420. You know, uh, we do a lot of putters and <clears throat> we also, and you see in the bottom right here, uh, do these, you know, Klein bottle openers. I think that anybody that's interested in 3D printing has seen these and they've been around forever. Um, they are, you know, one of the, still today, still one of the coolest designs. And what's nice about that is you're basically you know, the designer is taking a algorithm and spreading an algorithm across the, you know, the surface of the component, which is design freedom, things you could never have done before. So um, that's always, you know, type of designs that are exciting for us to see. Um, <clears throat> the top right here is kind of just like we do a lot of cabinet monetary as well. We used to back in the day even have our own uh, hardware line, which, you know, it, it, we kind of transitioned away from that. But uh, you know, that just the, uh, the application base is, you know, ever growing. And then the other thing that I want to talk a little bit about too, is the, you know, the finish options. We have actually almost a dozen different finishes that we offer and they're anything from gold plating to this gun metal style, the, 
uh, dark black color to kind of, you know, an antique bronzy um, color as well. And they're offered both in matte and both in, both in matte and polish. Um, and then there's also a nickel offering as well. So that finishes still, you know, on the, and the skeletal structure is still 420. It's just a, a post finish. Okay, we have another poll question which ha has been added. So if you can take a few seconds to fill this out. This one, I'll, I'll definitely be shocked if we have more people with two or more years experience. However, as Brandon keeps talking about, I mean, we've been doing this for 14 years. So depending on who came for the, from to watch the webinar, we, you know, we'll see, we'll see where it comes from, but this is an exciting one to see kind of who's, who's watching today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, interested to see, and you know, I, <clears throat> we all get a lot of questions, you know, what, what drives your considerations. So I really want to kind of cover that at a high level today and to help everybody that's in this, you know, 46% that's popping up right here. Great. So we'll we'll kind of jump in a little bit about what drives Binder Jennings considerations for design. Um, and if there are people on here that have been using you know, the Shapeways for, for a long time, you, you see the, the feedback for design considerations. So um, I want people to I want everyone to understand, you know, kind of what it drives that. So there are, you know, limitations to wall thickness and that wall thickness really is driven by are we able to pull it out of that box in that green state? Um, that the powdering process drives a lot of our design. And <clears throat> if there are things, if there are walls that are undersized, if there are walls that are unsupported, then we know it after the centering process that we're gonna have a product that is not, you know, the high quality and high quality is important. So uh, if you see on the right here, you know that, that distortion happens during the infiltration process for two reasons. One, it's an unsupported wall, you know, over a certain amount of distance. And two, it's a very, very thin wall that, you know, it's prone to have that type of distortion because of how thin it is. You, there is a limitation to thin is great because it's saving money, but at the same time, thin can cause, you know, a distortion factor on the, on the back end process. So we try to push, you know, these minimum wall thicknesses considering that, you know, infiltration process. <clears throat> and you'll we'll also try to, you know, get a limit of 0.8 millimeter or 30 thou on, excuse me, the, the depth and width or any type of feature, especially lettering. And the main reason why is because during the infiltration process, there is a skinning over, we call it, of this bronze. Um, and as that bronze skins over, something that's underneath that limit, not only will it jump that gap, fill in that gap, but it will also, as you can see here, kind of wash out that detail that people spend a lot of time designing. Um, so that's important for us to give that feedback, you know, down the line. So during, during our process, we talk a little bit about the powdering process. <clears throat> and as we pull this green body part out of the box and the powder the part, we're basically evacuating the loose powder from the component. If there are any type of interior cavities that, are, that we cannot get access to, the powder then, then cannot be removed. Um, so you'll basically just have trapped powder. So if you have some type of, let's just say you have internal cooling channels that the powder is still stuck in there, then obviously that component is not functional. So we, you know, try to have a output hole that allows us to, one, to remove that powder, and two, allows us to fill that back up with that alumina grit we talked a little bit about earlier to help support that cavity during the infiltration or centering process. There's a lot of detail in here, but you know, that at a high level, that's really what we're, we're kind of looking for during that, you know, review process. Um, 
we, you know, ask for a lot of inside edge radiuses. And the main driving factor for that is to eliminate any type of thermal stress during the centering process. So anytime you have this hard 90 degree edge, um, it's going to want to push and pull at each other. Um, and also the turbulence of the bronze as it flows into that part doesn't like 90 degree bends either. So the way that I explain it, the, I think that works the best, at least in my mind, is when you weld two tubes together and flow water down through there, the turbulence at that corner is going to be high. Whereas if you have a single tube and you bend that tube and it has that radial bend at it on it, <clears throat> the flow of water is more fluid. So that's kind of how you have to think about your designs in order to reduce or mitigate that stress during the, our thermal operations. Okay. Um, and also, you know, pointed edges, you know, we are capable of doing that. The process does achieve that, but if it gets too fine, if you look at this, you know, triangle here, if that triangle is more acute, you have obviously a sharper edge <clears throat> and it's still powdered metal at the end of the day. So as you're blowing air across that surface and vacuuming across that surface, there is potential for that, you know, there's potential for breakage during the, the powdering process. And there's another factor that drives it as well is, especially if a part's tumbled in our you know, finishing process, that is an aggressive process because this 420 is so hard. Um, it will be prone to kind of round out any of those, you know, sharp points as well anyway. So those are just things we point out, you know, it's all about, like, like I said earlier, quality, how pleasant at the end of the day. Okay. Exciting stuff, man. Um, so, you know, we are, we're looking to, you know, Shapeways and Next One are looking to launch this 316 material. We're all really excited about it. Um, not only does it give you this high detail I don't know if anybody re recognizes the, what's what's going on here. This is Hogwarts Castle for all of us nerds, which I think we all are. Um, and, you know, you can see the high, high detail, you know, capability with this material. Um, that's what we're most excited about. We're also excited to, you know, have some, you know, oxidation issues eliminated if there's any concern with that. Um, this is a premium product. So, you know, the pricing may not line up with what you see today, but it's still going to be close. And as we grow, it will only get better and better. Um, and, you know, the reason for this resolution is driven by the droplet size, powder size, layer thickness. So very, very excited to, you know, get this material launched to everybody that is, you know, here today. And, you know, what, what we kind of, what we kind of ask, go ahead. Uh, sorry, can you talk about the difference between 316 and 316L and the cost difference? Yeah, so <clears throat> the difference between, so 316L really just means low carbon. And there's a fine, fine window for carbon, right? And so that low carbon means low corrosion, low oxidation. 316 really is also just called, you know, maybe just 316H. So 316H just means your carbon content is higher and that carbon will make you prone to oxidation. So that's really the difference between, you know, that nomenclature at the end. Yep. So, you know, just at the end of the day, you know, it's, we, all, we love seeing these new designs brought on by the Shapeways customer base. And we just push and push and push for you to rethink, you know, outside the box more and more every day. And if you look at these components we have here that we're, you know, added manufacturing, they cannot, because of the you know, organic shape of them with the less waste and the, you know, the think outside the box thought process in mind. <clears throat> utilizing you know binder jetting process to in order to achieve these components and also being able to use this um, these you know simulation softwares to see if the strength makes sense um, and then you're you know lightweighting 
you still have the same strength and you have you know the same material that you're using today as well material be plated with gold printed with gold plated with gold okay um yes it can uh so the keep in mind that the the plating is decorative plating it is not industrial grade by any means um but you can you can anything you can do with our traditional 420 series bar stock you can do with our printed material powder coating nitriding etc it, it any potential you can still achieve okay you know so this just kind of lays out a little bit about you know the turn times and you know um it will only ever get better and faster as well as we transition to these quicker machines um what's nice is the capability to use the platform that shapeways has built out for the manufacturing process it allows this turn time to happen so fast uh, where we can actually upload parts as soon as they're uploaded in the system and get them on the printer within you know 24 hours and then our goal was to get them you know through the process through finishing and through the qa and through to you know um you know shipping out as fast as possible all right well we have loved the questions throughout I'm scrolling through to see. Yeah, I did miss some. And like I said, we will follow up with you if we did not get to your particular question. I have uh, one question, Brand, just kind of off the cuff. Um, what's the most interesting thing you've seen come through at your eight years at X1? Like something huh. that I guess you just would have been totally shocked that could have been actually printed or created or even cool application. I have to say, we did a a model. So you know, like these shadow models, right? <clears throat> Where you look on the wall and it looks like something different than what the formation is. <clears throat> so the casting on the wall was a brain and each one of these components was printed was basically like synapse or, you know, nucleus brain structure where there were these crazy wavy geometries that I was like, we're never going to get those out of the box. And, you know, we, uh, I don't know, we printed like 500 of these. Um, and they, it was a giant, giant hanging sculpture. Um, and basically, you know, we just worked through the DFAM process in order to be able to achieve, you know, bonding these components together. It would never, we would, we would have had a really hard time doing them as one unit. But what we did was we basically centered the body and then we, you know, printed the tentacles, I'll call them, uh, separate and then formed everything together. And then they were all plated and hung up and had this really, really cool, you know, shadow formation. It was a uh, it was an interesting project. You know, the only other thing that I would say um, <clears throat> is we designed this. 10 foot tall nail that had it was a 10 penny nail essentially if anyone knows what that is and it also had nails all through it so <clears throat> that was interesting <laughs> uh, it was uh you know one of the largest larger things are always exciting for us uh because it's a little bit outside the box we like to have the envelope push because it makes our team here think more you know the the technicians are always excited. They're like, oh, we can do this. You know, it's it's all about pushing the limits constantly. Taking on that new project. Use for 3D printing in the future. Huh. Um, I would say absolutely it, it's gonna you know continue to grow um things will always be adapting always be changing um you know we're <clears throat> we're looking at you know on a more industrial scale as, as business grows and supply chains transition 
And we're, you know, looking at robotics in order to eliminate, you know, these, you know, people trying to touch thousands and thousands apart. It's a lot of, it's a, it today is a big hands-on process. And as, you know, AI grows, we'll be able to build in the sensitivity to pick these parts up because they are still weak. Um, and we'll be able to, you know, build out this fully automated process where you hit the button, go home, come home the next day, and everything's ready. You know, that's that's where, you know, Bonner Jennings is going to go. Yeah, I agree with you. And I actually think um, the software, we're at the very, very precipice of what uh, AI can do in the 3D printing world. Um, you know, you see some of the really cool design softwares now, like in topology and stuff, using that to help kind of create um, new crazy structures. And then, you know, uh, kind of what you're talking about, Brandon, is the amount of parts that are coming off. You know, what if we had some automated system that could scan those parts, know exactly who they are, and then get them to the uh, to the right person. So again, these are just a couple of applications I'm seeing, but I, I have to say, I think AI is definitely going to be integrated and, and we don't even know all the different possibilities that's going to be used in 3D printing for the future. Yeah, I agree. Great. Well, Brandon and Steve, thank you very much for walking us through the X1 materials and our partnership with you. We're very appreciative of it and everything that you do. If you would like more information, please visit shapeways.com to learn more. You can find the X1 materials there. And a link to this recording will be sent out to everyone who attended and those that could not make it for the entire time so that you can watch the recording of this yeah. webinar. So again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.